Welcome to Marius Gabriel, who's the author of um, 10 best-selling novels, really, um, of historical novels. The Designer, The Ocean Liner, The Parisians are perhaps some of your best-known books at the moment. But tell us, um, Marius, how you first got into writing. Um, I was about... Uh, oh, good morning, by the way. Um, I was about 24, 25, and I just got married. And was doing a PhD and not earning anything. And I, I suddenly needed a lot of money, um, much more than I was getting from my scholarship. So I wrote a, a trial book for Mills and Boone and, and sent it in under a pseudonym and, and got a response and they didn't take that book or the next one, but they took the third one. And within a few months, I realized that pursuing my PhD was not nearly as good a bet as following writing as a career. So I dropped out of the PhD and, and began to write full time. So that must have been around 1986, something like that. That's an amazing story. And, and what, what took you into writing Mills and Boons, though? Because, I mean, you know, it's, was that a natural genre for you? Usually it's, it's, it's the books that we read that you tend to write in first. Yes. Um, I, I wrote for Mills and Boone because it seemed accessible. Um, they're a publisher who, who publish a lot of books. At that time, I think they published even more than they do now. At that time, they were publishing something like 20 books a month. And I, I reckon there was a better chance um, of getting something accepted rather than going for one of the more mainline publishers, um, you know, who I also thought would be more demanding. I was actually wrong. Mills and Boone were a very demanding publisher. And the art of writing uh, short romances is is a tricky one, as anyone will tell you. And it did take me some time to, to get into it. But I suppose it, it was, it was a, a commercial decision at first. Be, you know, I, I just wanted to maximize my, my chances of being published. How many books did you end up writing in the end? I'm not absolutely sure, but something like 32 or 33 books, maybe 34. Something over 30, anyway. So what um, made you change from the Mills and Boone's books? I mean, obviously, that you were doing well with those who'd written 30-odd books. What made you then start writing different genres? I wrote for Mills and Boone for around, I suppose, coming on for eight years, between seven and eight years, and... Yes, it was, it was a very steady income, and I was immensely grateful to have that income. But as I, as I developed as a writer, I wanted to do something longer. And at that time, Mills and Byrne didn't have any... Uh, the maximum length was about 50,000 words. I think 55 was the maximum. And... Um, Obviously, they, they, they were very much of a kind. Uh, I wouldn't say they were formulaic, but, you know, you were restricted to the kinds of things you could write about. And I just, I just needed to, to do something on a big scale and with more themes. So the first book that I... Um, the, the, the first longer book that I tried was called The Original Sin, and that took me a long time to write. It took me about two years to write, um, but it enabled me to get into things that I wanted to write about, like drug addiction, crime, um, you know, things that, that couldn't possibly have gone into a, a, a romantic novel, novella. So I suppose that's, that's how I, I broke out, but I did continue to write for Mills and Byrne, and in fact, the last book I did for them was about 10, 10 or 12 years ago. They came back to me and asked me to do 
something for a series which I did and it, it was fun to go back and uh, and revisit that that genre. I have to say that you've um, you had a little bit of break up there in the signal because you're, you're actually oh, talking to us from Egypt aren't you? Y yes I am. I'm in Cairo yeah. Yeah our bandwidth is not too good here so I do apologize for any dropouts that uh, I get a little message on the screen in Arabic saying something which I assume is bad news <laughs> about the bandwidth. Okay, well, moving on. So you wrote the original Sin um, and then The Mask of Time as well. And they're both, they were both um, kind of family mysteries, weren't they, set against a kind of historical background. But you, though, you also wrote a contemporary novel, which was uh, The House of Many Rooms. W was that yeah. because you wanted to again? We wanted to move on in genres or was that more to in response to the marketplace? No, I, at, at that time I was in a very um, happy place of feeling that I could write about anything I wanted to. I, I'm sure you know, um, as a writer, that you're very often unable to write the book that you want to write because it's not commercial or because the publishers aren't buying or publishing those kinds of books. And at that time, I was blithely unaware of this brutal reality of the marketplace. And I just thought, oh, yeah, I can, I can do anything I want now. So I wrote the contemporary book, um, just assuming that it would do as well as all the rest. And uh, of course, my publishers immediately said, well, you are now branded as a historical novelist. You can't write mysteries or contemporary books. It's, it's, it's not commercially a good idea. So from then on, I sort of stuck to books set at least 30 years in the past. Cosmopolitan um, accused you of keeping you reading while your dinner burns. That must have been a great compliment to get. For That's fantastic. Yeah. Yes, that um, was one of the nicest things that's been said about me. Um, I mean, all writers treasure the nice things people say and try and forget the nasty but that's one of the nice ones yeah you do write historical novels so moving on to sort of what people say do do you i mean you obviously do an awful lot of research into the period and, and things like that do you really absolutely stick accurately to what you see as the facts yes i do i try very hard not to falsify either the historical events or the characters that I put into my books. If I take a real life character, um, I will research the way they spoke, the way they write, their movements. I'll try and find as much about them as I can. And even if I make up um, words to, to put into their dialogue, I try to keep that as, as true to life as possible. But as always, it, it, it's my interpretation, and even regular historians will differ in their opinion of a, of a historical character. You know, you, you need to look at sort of whenever a movie comes out or a book, there's, there's often people that will pillory writers for not sticking to the facts, but often history isn't really a great story, is it? No. Um, the... Um, the conventional wisdom is that history needs to be edited in order to make a good story. I, I feel it's the other way around. I, I think that the things people do in their real lives are so extraordinary that most people don't believe them. And I have had quite heavy criticism from readers and from professional reviewers about the characters that um, I have taken and usually the accusation is oh, you must have made this up this person never said that they could never have done this but in fact um, the extraordinary events in the lives of people like Rosemary Kennedy d defy belief you, you cannot believe can one really believe that the, the, the sister of a president, the, the daughter of a very, very famous man, could be mentally destroyed by an operation and stuck into 
you know, a holding cell for 40 years of her life. You know, could this really happen? Yes, yes, it did happen. So usually when people say, oh, that's, that's nonsense, you, you've been untrue, they simply don't know what the reality of those lives were. I don't mean that in an arrogant way, but I, um, I, I do my research and I try to stay true to that research. Um, how do you go about researching? And obviously, you know, you, you're doing a PhD, so you're, you're obviously kind of well, used to the, the, the kind of academic research mode. What, what's your kind of process for researching a novel? I think reading is the most important thing. You need, if you're going to write about a very famous person, you need to read absolutely everything that there is. Read it, make notes, underline, uh, pick up things that you think could be useful, but also bear in mind the limitations of the character. Then there's a visual element, you need photographs, you need video if there is, so you need to hunt for that. You need to look for anything that gives you clues as to what the person looked like, how they dressed, how they behaved, the, the, the intonation of their speech. All of that comes into it. And if you're lucky and the character is a 20th century character, there will be a lot of material. If not, if you're going back further back than the 1950s, that material gets less and less, especially video. Um, you know, there are just very, very few. I mean, television wasn't a big thing in anyone's life until the 50s. so. Television is the great medium of the interview. And um, before that, you've got little snippets from Pathé News or little fragments that you might find on YouTube. And, and you, you have to work with that. How long does it take you from, from getting an idea to actually the finished novel and through all that whole process? Writing the book uh, will usually take less than a year, something like six months between six months and a year. But the research will often take several years because the idea for a book may come three or four years before I get down to writing it. And in that period, I will read, research, make notes. Um, I use notebooks, which I write in every day and accumulate information. So I, I suppose between the idea of writing a book about a particular period and getting it published can be four years. You're originally from South Africa, I believe, born as yes. well. Your parents um, had a small newspaper, so I guess writing was in your blood. But you've traveled yes. a lot as well. Yes, I, I've uh, always traveled around. Um, we are now returning to the motherland. We're going back to Britain, hopefully to stay but I've lived in um, Italy and Spain, uh, in South Africa, of course, and um, currently we've spent six years in Egypt. And, uh, but I think it, it's, it's time to come home now. And do, do, the, do the places that you've been to add color to your novels? Do you use that a lot? Yes, they do. Um, I feel that you, you can't really write about a place without having time there. So when I wrote The Seventh Moon, which is largely set in the Far East, I, I made an, a real effort of traveling to Borneo, uh, to Laos, to Cambodia, to Vietnam, to Hong Kong, to, to, to get the atmosphere of the place and to stay there for a while, to drink it in, so that I knew what I was writing about. If, if, if you try and conjure a place up out of your imagination, it will never be as rich or as, um, as redolent as, as the real experience. So how do you get the, the ideas for the books? Is it something that you just kind of come across in the research or are you prompted by publishers who are kind of asking for something specific? It's usually the, the, the people, the characters. Uh, I, I think this is the critical part of any novel and almost any kind of writing is the personality 
of the person that you're writing about. It, it has to interest you. It has to say something to you, reach out to you from the past, whether the, the person is a good person or a bad person. They, they must intrigue you. And that's how I worked my art by reading a biography of a, of a person or, or listening to their music if they're a composer and, and feeling, oh, this is interesting. This is someone that speaks to me. So let's follow this up and see where it goes. You've been published in different ways or different um, over, the, over the years. Tell me about the kind of differing experiences you've had with, with different publishers and, and which way do you like being published the best, I guess? Well, publishing has changed a lot over the um, 30 years or so that I've been a writer. I suppose it's more like 40 years, really. Um, of course, when I first started writing, there were only print books, and print books were divided into paperbacks and hardbacks, and each had a different market. Um, and the big change in, in my lifetime, in most people's, Lifetimes has been the advent of digital publishing, which has opened the door to self-publishing. Um, and self-publishing, of course, goes hand in hand, or, or should we say parallel, to being published by an online publisher. So at the moment, I self-publish some of my books, and others are published by Lake Union, which is the fiction imprint of Amazon. And each, each has a different feel. Responsible for your own cover, your own blurb, your textual editing, everything is your responsibility. Whereas being published by a big publisher like Amazon means giving up all that which takes a, a burden off the writer and allows the writer to write and not have to worry about making the cover, doing the blurb, editing, and so forth. But also you lose control. Self-publishing is great because you, you have absolute control, but it's, it, it, you know, it's slavery. It's, uh, it's really a 24-hour-a-day job between publicity, but, um, actually working on the book, working on the cover, marketing, answering questions. It's, it's a sweatshop. I was going to say, actually, because the covers of the Ocean Liner, Prisons, and um, the designer, they're stunning. Did you, do you have any, did you have any input into those covers? Because they, they really are striking covers. They are beautiful, and thank you. Um, yes, I was, I was lucky enough to have input into all of those covers. Um, my editors have, are, are very kind and have always said, what do you think the cover should look like? And I will send in some things I've taken off the internet, things that I think um, are fruitful. They'll work on those and they'll give me an option of particular model and particular colors. And so it, it, it's a great relationship which usually produces at the end something that makes us both happy. Your research, and you do talk about taking several years to research a book, so what, give us an idea of your kind of your, your, your writing day, how, how do you kind of go about things? My writing day is mainly concentrated in the morning. I will get to my desk around seven especially in Cairo, where it gets terribly hot. Um, and I'll work from seven till one or two, which gives me a good five or six hour stint. Um, and then in the afternoon, I will, I, I won't write anymore, but I will read what I've done, correct it, make notes for the next day, so that when I start again the next morning, I have something written down for me to look at and think, okay, that's where I'm going to pick up. So it, 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 it's, I suppose it's an eight hour day, like almost any other job. 
You've been quoted in the past as saying that, uh, like many self-taught persons, I had an idiot as a teacher, I believe. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, that, that's very true. When you, when you teach yourself, you, you start out with the premise that you don't know anything. So it's, it's groping in the dark and making mistakes and learning from those mistakes and hopefully not actually being dragged down into the abyss by those mistakes. So do you have any kind of tips for aspiring authors, you know, having been there and done that and come through the other end? Y yes, I, d I do have tips. And I think the most important thing for uh, people who, who, who've got writing in them is to remember that this has to sell. It's very, very important. You, you can write for yourself if you're wealthy and, and, and don't need the money and only want to please yourself. But if you want to sell the books, if you want people to read them and enjoy them, remember that it must be the kind of book that people will buy. So don't just please yourself. Be true to yourself, but remember that all books fall into categories, all books fall into genres. Look at each genre, look at the genre that you, you have chosen. Make sure that your book fits into that genre and make sure that it's fun to read. If it's not fun, if it's not pleasant, if it's not exciting, if it doesn't grip you from the first page, a publisher, 10% of it. So be commercial, especially as as writing becomes as publishing becomes more and more difficult for everybody remember you must please the reader that's that's the biggest tip i can give you okay now you're um you're going to read in a moment uh, an excerpt from the ocean line and first of all can you just kind of paint the picture of what the story is about for us it's the story of a group of people some real historical figures and others, ones that I've made up, who uh, escaped from France as um, Hitler's armies began the invasion. Um, the ship that they were on was called the um, SS Manhattan. She was a big luxury liner, who, which was um, um, put into service by the American government to bring American citizens back from Europe um, with the idea that in, in the beginning that only Americans would be on board. In the end, she had to take a large number of refugees, especially Jewish um, people, communists, anyone who was liable to be destroyed by the Nazis. And um, the, the, the voyage was uh, a, a very exciting one, very thrilling, dangerous. Submarines were, German submarines were already actively torpedoing <clears throat> transatlantic traffic um, just before the Manhattan set off. A, a liner with lots of passengers on board, lots of Americans on board had been torpedoed and sunk with a loss, quite a lot, considerable loss of life. So t to me, it was a very dramatic and exciting uh, historical event that I wanted to write about. Would you read us an excerpt from the book? Yes. Well, okay. this, is, this is a description of um, the first supper that the characters have on board the Manhattan. <coughs> the cabin class dining room was an amazing confection of glittering Americana, as though Marie Antoinette had built a palace in Wyoming and had it decorated by the Comanche. High in the lofty ceiling, crystal chandeliers illuminated colorful murals depicting redskins hunting the mighty buffalo or greeting the white man with gifts of pumpkins and corn. Braves on mustangs galloped across a prairie framed between heavy velvet curtains. Cowboys waved their Winchesters aloft among gilded Rococo swags. 
A sea of snowy linen and gleaming silverware covered the three dozen tables below, each one of which seated six and had a softly glowing lamp as a centerpiece. The Commodore's table was set in the center of the huge room where everyone could see it and envy those invited to dine at it. Toscanini, in the place of honor, beside Commodore Randall tonight, had put on his spectacles to peruse the menu. Commodore Randall, impeccable in his mess jacket, leaned towards Toscanini like an amiable grampus. I recommend the live boiled lobster, Mr. Toscanini, followed by the Boston Sole Meunier. Servitori in Parma, Toscanini replied in his heavy Italian accent. I ate only boiled the fish for three years. Since then, I eat nothing that comes from the sea. One of the other passengers, a plump woman from Topeka named Mrs. Dabney, traveling with her largely silent husband, tugged at her immense pearls to draw attention to them. How romantic that you rose from poverty to preeminence, maestro, she exclaimed. Poverty is in no sense romantic, signora, Toscanini retorted. What about Rodolfo and Mimi in La Boheme? That's romantic, isn't it? La Boheme is an opera, Toscanini pointed out. After dying of hunger, the performers get up and cash their checks. Mrs. Dabney laughed gaily. Dear maestro, do you think Mussolini will bring Italy into the war? Mussolini is capable of any brutality. Only Britain can stop him. We had to pull the Brits out of the fire last time, said Dr. Emmett Meese, a prominent New York surgeon. Why do they keep starting wars if they can't finish them? We should just let things take their course and let fascism consume Europe. We have nothing to gain by getting our fingers burned. It's not what you have to gain, Toscanini commented dryly. It's what you have to lose. It's not our fight. I say America first and to hell with the rest. Mussolini offered to make me a senator, Toscanini said. I told him the Emperor Caligula made his horse a senator, but I am only a donkey that you like to beat. Do you know why I hold my head like this to one side? When I refused to pay the fascist hymn at La Scala, Mussolini sent his men. They beat me in the street. They beat me to the ground with clubs. Ever since then, I live with the injuries. Sometimes I have to cancel engagements because I cannot lift my arm. That is fascism. That's great. Thank you. You're, you're, you're a natural storyteller. Do, do, have you done audio books? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I haven't. Do you enjoy reading? Do you enjoy reading your story, sir? Um, I, I really don't enjoy speaking in public, reading in public, even giving interviews like this. It, 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 I, I'm, I'm very shy, really. And um, it's, always a, it's always an effort for me to do it. Well, you've come across brilliantly. So just, just finally to finish, just tell us uh, what's next for you. What, are you. Are you working on something at the moment? Um, yes, I'm working on a book now which is set a little further back than the last three, which were set in the um, Second World War. This one is set in the 1920s, and it's partly set in Persia, uh, modern-day Iran, and it has, has a di slightly different feel, although it does have the usual celebrities and famous people in it. It's, um, it, it has there's a modern component as well, because we have a character in the present day who is investigating these events, which took place a hundred years ago. Well, we look forward to that one. Thank you so much, Marius, for joining us on My VLF. Thank you, Gwyn. Lovely to talk to you.